In 1586, Sir Francis Drake arrived off the coast of present-day North Carolina with a massive fleet, ships heavy with Spanish gold and riches he'd stolen privateering in the Caribbean, South America, Florida. He came to check in on the Roanoke Colony, a group of 108 Englishmen who had set up a fort on the north end of Roanoke Island, part of North Carolina's Outer Banks. He came bearing these stolen gifts to give the colony he thought was surely flourishing by now. He found them instead in bad shape and whisked them back to England to save them from near certain death. But did you know Drake had more than gold and silver aboard his ships? He had a reported 500 enslaved Africans and indigenous South Americans that he had also stolen from the Spanish. Did you know that when he returned to England, 400 of them were missing? And did you know that despite the fame and infamy of the English lost colony that would disappear a year later, there may have been a whole nother lost colony left behind by Drake that no one even cared to look for? Let's fix that. Hello, I'm Shay LaFontaine, and you're listening to History Fix, where I discuss lesser-known true stories from history you won't be able to stop thinking about. I'm coming at you today with a mini fix instead of a full length episode. September has just been insane with sick kids, sick everyone really, back to school. Yeah, I'm just trying to catch up. So this is a mini fix, but it will not disappoint. And I will be back next Sunday with a full length episode. But this is kind of a long mini fix. I don't know. It's it's good enough. I put a lot into the last two episodes about the Roanoke Colonies, the Lost Colony, and was absolutely honored to interview Michael Oberg, who is Distinguished Professor of History at SUNY Geneseo University in Western New York and author of the book The Head in Edward Nugent's Hand. And you'll be hearing from Michael some in this episode as well. So if you skipped that two-parter on the Roanoke Colonies, please please go back and listen to that first. It will make this mini fix so much more enjoyable if you're caught up on Roanoke first, because this is a follow-up to that. I've had the Roanoke colonies on my master list of episode ideas since the very inception of this podcast. I was putting it off, though, procrastinating because I knew I couldn't cover it without diving in completely headfirst and just really giving it my all. It's a topic that is near and dear to my heart and one that I happen to know a lot about, but I also really wanted to do it justice, which is why I reached out to Michael as an actual expert on the topic. I also read his entire book, The Head in Edward Nugent's Hand, in like two days, which with two small children and basically two jobs is rather impressive if I'm allowed to toot my own horn. But really, I think that's tooting Michael's horn. The book was hard to put down. I highly recommend it if you want to know more about the Roanoke colonies. But in all my research for these episodes, I kept coming across this little side note that would just get thrown in about Sir Francis Drake and these 500-some enslaved people that he supposedly had with him when he arrived to check on the 1585 colony on Roanoke Island and ultimately ended up rescuing them. So let me back up and do a quick recap. In 1585, England attempted to establish its first colony in North America. They sent about 600 men to the outer banks of North Carolina under the leadership of Sir Richard Grimville and Ralph Lane, who was to be the governor of the colony. However, when they arrived, their flagship Tiger ran aground while trying to pass through a shallow inlet into the Sound, which is like a smaller body of brackish water between the barrier islands and the mainland. There in the sound is an island called Roanoke Island. This would be the location of their settlement, but they ran their ship aground and lost most of their food and supplies trying to get to it. Left with only around 20 days worth of provisions, Grenville took most of the men and headed back to England for more, leaving Ralph Lane with a group of around 108 men. Ralph Lane was a military officer, not a diplomat, so he made some very poor choices. 
that fairly quickly destroyed any hope of peaceful relations with the Carolina Algonquian people that lived in this area. He became more and more paranoid that the nearby Werowance, or leader, Pemisipan, was conspiring against the English and plotting an attack. So he decided to preemptively cut off Pemisipan's head in order to prevent the treachery. Yes, that is the head in Edward Nugent's hand. Unfortunately, this colony was dependent on Pemisipan's people for food, so they kind of shot themselves in the foot. Lucky for Lane and his men, Sir Francis Drake showed up about a week later and rescued them, whisking them all back to England in the nick of time. Now, this terrible fail did not stop England from sending another colony around a year later, 118 people, this time with women and children. This ill-fated group would ultimately disappear entirely from the island, going down in history as the lost colony of Roanoke. But let's back up to that Sir Francis Drake bit again. It seems pretty insignificant, just a small blip in the story. But while I was researching, I found a few sources that mentioned something quite interesting when they got to the part about Sir Francis Drake coming to the rescue. Something I must admit I did not know, and it blew my mind. I made a note to ask Michael about it during our interview, but he actually brought it up on his own. But we really don't know, Shay, what what would have happened, right? Because while this, just after this go, it, it takes place, Francis Drake arrives and, and he's, his, his arrival almost coincides with a, a, a hurricane, which causes a lot of ships to be lost. So there's... According to the account, there's not really any way for Drake to leave any ships for the English to sustain this colony, and everyone just packs up and goes away. There is a story, and this was told by David Beers Quinn. He speculated about this, who's one of the kind of the dean of the, the field of Rona, a scholar of Raleigh. He said that when Drake arrived, he had probably, you know, several hundred indigenous slaves and African slaves on board his ship that he'd, he'd picked up on his voyage to Roanoke because he cut through the Caribbean and up Florida. And those people weren't on board his ships when he reached England. So Quinn speculated those people were cast out on the long, on, on the Outer Banks somewhere as well. You know, we can't prove that. We don't know. But it's an intriguing possibility. Yeah. So if you didn't catch that, Sir Francis Drake reportedly had around 500 enslaved people with him. Africans and indigenous South Americans that he had stolen from the Spanish while privateering in the Caribbean just before heading to Roanoke Island. When he returned to England with Ralph Lane's men, he only had around 100 enslaved people with him. So we're talking about somewhere in the ballpark of 400 missing people that disappeared between Roanoke Island and England. What happened to those people? So for me, reading this, hearing Michael bring it up organically before I even had a chance to ask him about it, I'm thinking, we have a whole nother mystery here. Everyone has been so focused on the lost colony. What happened to those 116 missing English colonists? But what about the 400 enslaved people that Sir Francis Drake had with him? What happened to them? Why is no one looking for them? So I'm starting my own investigation right now. So here's the plan in 1585. Grenville and Lane are going to Roanoke Island to establish the colony. Sir Francis Drake is heading to the Caribbean, South America, Florida to do some privateering. He's going to attack and rob Spanish ports and ships legally with the blessing of Queen Elizabeth I of England. And then he's going to rendezvous on Roanoke Island with the others. Drake will show up with all this loot to resupply and shore up the colony that Grenville and Lane have been establishing. That's the plan. Now, Grenville and Lane fail horribly at their part of the plan, the whole establishing the permanent colony part. Sir Francis Drake is actually quite successful on his end. His fleet manages to claim a good deal of riches from the Spanish, including a reported 500 enslaved people. A Spaniard who was taken captive by Drake and later released in Cuba told authorities there that Drake had captured 300 enslaved indigenous people, mostly women, from what is now Colombia in South America, and another 200, quote, Negroes, Turks, and Moors who do menial labor. 
You have to remember, within the context of this time period, these people are commodities. They are enslaved. They were property of the Spanish. Sir Francis Drake stole them, and now they're property of the English. After Cuba, they head to St. Augustine, Florida, on their way up the coast to meet with the colony. They loot and destroy St. Augustine, claiming more goods to bring with them to Roanoke Island. Drake apparently left three enslaved Africans behind in St. Augustine, and they told a Spanish dispatch from Cuba that Drake, quote, meant to leave all the Negroes he had in a fort and settlement established at Roanoke by the English who went there a year ago. He intended to leave the 250 blacks and all of his small craft there and cross to England with only the larger vessels, end quote. So they headed to Roanoke Island. Drake thinks he's going to roll up on this well-established colony that's waiting for these silly offerings he's brought with him. He has like a bunch of fancy doorknobs and hinges he took off the houses in St. Augustine. He has fancy furniture he's looted from Spanish mansions and a massive bronze piece of a cathedral. These are not survival provisions. These are fancy, unnecessary baubles and knickknacks that you can't eat. They're extra. But that's where he thinks the colony's at. And it's not. It's not there. It's in a dark place. They've just murdered the indigenous leader that previously fed them. They have no supplies. They've already eaten their dogs. They're holed up in their fort, hiding from the retaliation of Pemisipan's men. And they're really freaking lucky that Drake shows up when he does. But these 500 enslaved people are part of the provisions Drake is intending to give to the Roanoke colony. His plan is to leave them there. Some of them, anyway. When he gets there, he sees what kind of state the colony is in. (laughs) Lane is like, get us out of here. He wants Drake to take them farther north to the Chesapeake Bay to scout out a better location for the colony. But like Michael said, they're met with horrible storms, likely a hurricane that batters Drake's fleet, destroys many of his ships. So he has all these people His original crew, plus 500 enslaved people, plus Lane's 100-some men, plus all this stuff that he needs to get off the island, but he's down a bunch of ships. He's like, we can't go to Chesapeake. We better hope we can make it home to England at this point. And they do. But when they arrive, they only have 100 enslaved Turkish people and three West Africans. David Beers Quinn, a historian from the University of Liverpool, was the expert on this. You heard Michael mention his name. In his book, England and the Discovery of America, he wrote, quote, The only reasonable explanation is that a considerable number of Indians and Negroes were put ashore on the Carolina Outer Banks and equipped with the pots and pans, locks and bolts, boats and launches of St. Augustine, end quote. Other historians disagree with Quinn's theory, though. Other theories suggest the missing enslaved people were lost at sea during that hurricane they encountered, or possibly Drake sold them off to lighten the load on the way back to England. These historians argue that enslaved laborers were valuable commodities. Why would he just ditch them on Roanoke Island? But at the same time, there wasn't really a market for them in Elizabethan England. The 100 enslaved Turks Drake gave to Queen Elizabeth when he returned, were gifted to the Ottoman sultan as a way to gain his allegiance against the Spanish. They didn't really have slavery in England. There's also no record of them drowning during the storm. You have to remember, John White, Thomas Harriet, and Ralph Lane were all aboard Drake's ships back to England. They all three, especially White and Harriet, kept extremely detailed accounts of everything they saw and did during the expedition. Surely they would have mentioned at some point the loss of 400 lives. I mean, I know their lives were not valued in the same way that white people were valued, but they were trade goods, they were commodities. It still seems like there would have been note of that. Trading them, selling them on the way back, uh, how did he fit them all on the ships? He lost a bunch of ships, and they, they were pushing it just to get Lane's men off Roanoke Island to the point where they're throwing the colonists' stuff overboard to lighten the load. Many of John White's paintings, uh, some of Harriet's notebooks are tossed overboard. Like, how much does a painting weigh? But that just goes to show how overloaded this journey back was. Could they have carried 400 more people with them? 
far enough to get to a place where they could have sold them off, um, somewhere in the Caribbean, maybe, that seems unlikely. So I'm left siding with Quinn. It kind of seems like the only option was to leave them behind. And yes, it is a huge loss financially, but I mean, easy come, easy go, right? He stole these people. He'll just steal some more later. It's fine. If that's the case, we're talking about 400 Africans and indigenous South Americans left behind on Roanoke Island. But here's the thing. They couldn't have stayed at the settlement for long because fairly soon after Drake rescued the colonists, Sir Richard Grenville returned with those supplies and there were no enslaved people there. How do we know it was soon after? Well, I'll tell you how we know, but it is a little gruesome, so just know that. When Grenville returned to resupply the colony, he found no one at the fort except two bodies that had been hanged, a white man and an indigenous man. Not sure who these guys were or why they were hanged. Some speculate that the indigenous man was Skyco, the son of the Choanoic Werowance Minotonin, who Lane had taken captive. Another mystery there, I suppose. But their bodies were still hanging. So what happens when you hang someone and you just leave them there is eventually, because of decomposition and the weight of the body and the fluids and whatnot, eventually the head disconnects from the body at the neck. So these bodies were intact and still hanging. That means, according to science, they could have only been there for around two weeks. If they were hanged by the English colonists who fled with Drake, which is likely hanging is kind of an English thing, I don't think indigenous people hanged people, then Grenville arrived around two weeks after Drake left. So if Drake left behind his 400 enslaved people, two weeks later, they were gone. That's not a lot of time. One theory is that they assimilated with the indigenous people living in the area. According to an article for the Washington Daily News by Lawrence Keach in Washington, North Carolina, an indigenous group known as the Melungeons claimed to be the descendants of this missing group of enslaved people. Melungeons are mixed ethnicity indigenous Americans that claim Portuguese, Turkish, Moorish, Arabic, Jewish, American Indian, and African descent. So basically the exact areas from which Drake's enslaved people came. Yeah, chills. Some of these Melungeons identify as Algonquian, originating from Virginia and North Carolina. Wayne Winkler, who is the president of the Melungeon Heritage Association, said in that article, quote, Oral tradition, cultural evidence, linguistics, and physical phenotypes point toward a strong Mediterranean and Middle Eastern component among most of the Melungeon-related populations, end quote. Even some of the words they use have possible Mediterranean Middle Eastern origins. According to Winkler, quote, a 1990 gene frequency study utilizing 177 Melungeon blood samples showed not significant differences between East Tennessee and Southwestern Virginian Melungeons and populations in Spain, Portugal, North Africa, Malta, Cyprus, Greece, Iran and Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. So we have these mixed race indigenous Americans with clear ties to Africa and the Mediterranean. It seems very good evidence to me that Drake did leave those people behind and that they very quickly left the settlement site and eventually assimilated with the Caroline Algonquian. But, I mean, DNA tests in 1990, that's like, that's archaic. Our ability to analyze DNA has come so incredibly far since 1990. I would love to see this analyzed further now, genetically. Even though Michael brought it up on his own in our interview, I decided to pry a little further. Just one last thing. I just want to take you back real quick. As you, I was one of my questions, but you actually brought it up yourself. I'm, I'm so intrigued by these enslaved people that Sir Francis Drake had with him and it's almost like this whole other potentially lost colony that it seems like no one's even really tried to find and I you know I you know I understand why you know because we're looking at Africans and South American indigenous people that unfortunately throughout time haven't been viewed in the same lens as Europeans but I guess I'm I'm wondering if if you know if you know any more about that do you know if anyone is 
trying to get to the bottom of that, at least now through like genealogy of the indigenous people that remain, if they were, you know, if they assimilated in this area. I know there's other theories that maybe they were lost at sea or traded on the way back. I, I didn't know if you had any um, clues about that. I, I don't. I mean, I, I imagine probably someone is looking into it because it's such a juicy topic that someone would be interested in it. But I, 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 it's been a while since I was really keeping up with it. So, so I don't know. You know, there is always a story that's always circulated for a long time, the Lumbee of North Carolina, because there were supposedly blue eyed people seen amongst them and stuff like that, that, that they were connected in some way to the lost colonists. There's no reason not to believe that they could be connected to these other lost colonists. Right. And, you know, the thing about <laughs> thing about lost colonists is you read travel accounts and, and, and the, the various voyagers, whether you're looking at Spanish or, or, or English people moving around the Atlantic world. They're depositing people hither and thither all the time. I mean, the, the, the shores of the Atlantic are just littered with the bodies of people who were left behind or cast aside or cast away. This, there's nothing that unusual about this story of people being lost. I don't know what happened to those, those slaves. No one, I don't think, ever will. There doesn't seem to be any archaeology that that would have would tell us a story but but think about it this way right what would they if they're enslaved what would they have carried with them nothing what would their material culture have been well it would have been whatever indigenous people provided them so i think it's gonna be very hard to find anything about them unfortunately i think michael's right i don't think they would have left many identifying clues behind besides traces of DNA and their descendants. With the English colonists, we have some clues. We have that shard of English borderware pottery to hint at where they may have gone. Enslaved people didn't have borderware. They were lucky to have clothing, shoes, anything at all. So I don't think we will find them. And at this point, even genetics testing is just been so long, there's no way of telling where that DNA may have come from. I, I don't know. I don't know that much about genetics, but it seems improbable. The problem is, the real problem is that records were not kept for these marginalized groups. No one cared to record their fate, what happened to them. No one cared what happened to them. All of the focus and attention and fanfare has been put on the disappearance of the 1587 English colony, the white people, the Christians, Virginia Dare. No one cared to look for the 400 South Americans, Africans, and Turks because they were enslaved. They were not people. They were property. But if we look at all the evidence, thanks to the research of David Beers Quinn, it certainly points to Roanoke Island. History tells us the first enslaved Africans arrived in what is now the United States in 1619 at Jamestown. That was the first African presence in the United States. If Quinn's theory is correct, that's totally wrong. The first Africans arrived in 1586 on Roanoke Island and they never left. If we put even a fraction of the effort into solving this mystery as we have the lost colony, we'd have to re-examine the origins of our whole country. Thank you all so very much for listening to History Fix. I hope you found this story interesting and maybe you even learned something new. Be sure to follow my Instagram at History Fix Podcast to see some images that go along with this episode and to stay on top of new episodes as they drop. I'd also really appreciate it if you'd rate and follow this podcast on whatever app you're using to listen. That'll make it much easier to get your next fix. Information used in this episode was sourced from The Head in Edward Nugent's Hand, and special thanks to Michael Oberg once again for sharing his knowledge with us, Smithsonian Magazine, Washington Daily News, and Family Tree Magazine. Links to all these sources can be found in the show notes.